I'm Claire Hubble, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss Russia's continued missile strikes across Ukraine and get the view on the ground in Kyiv the day after the city was rocked by fresh shelling. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Ukraine can win, Ukraine must win, and Ukraine will win. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis from the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 11th of October, day 230. To discuss the events of the last 24 hours in Ukraine, I'm joined by assistant comment editor Francis Sternley, Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes, Russia correspondent Natalia Vasilyeva, and freelance journalist Sergio Olmos, who's on the ground in Kyiv. I started off by asking Francis for the latest updates from the last 24 hours. Thanks, Claire. I'm filling in for Dom today on the military front on what has been a significant 24 hours for obvious reasons. Russia has launched fresh missile strikes overnight in Zaporizhia, targeting schools, medical facilities and homes as Vladimir Putin continues his campaign of so-called retaliation for the Crimea bridge attack over the weekend. At least 15 explosions have rocked the city, according to Ukrainian officials. This morning, air raid sirens are sounding again in Kyiv and the emergency services have put the country on alert for more strikes, something that I know Sergio will cover in more detail in due course. The emergency services have said that 19 people have been killed and 105 wounded so far after Russia fired 84 missiles across the country. We're also hearing this morning that fresh strikes are targeting energy sites, um, which is leaving uh, Lviv without power and water. Witnesses there are reporting explosions across the city around noon their time, uh, which is about 2 p.m. our time, uh, which is obviously coming the day after residents suffered blackouts and problems with the water yesterday. So... That is the military situation, clearly an attempt by the Russians to depict strength when really one can argue that it's the opposite. This is this is nothing new. um, These 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 tactics. Uh, I think also it's important to point out as well that it's highly questionable whether Russia would be able to continue these attacks indefinitely. The evidence would be suggestive that they are not able to do so, although obviously for all intents and purposes at the moment, they're making it seem that the opposite is the case. Um, Just one word as well, because I mentioned the Crimean bridge attack. Uh, I think it's just important to flag, because I know listeners were, were, were messaging us about this yesterday, that... Yes, it is a theory that it was a truck lorry lorry bomb that caused that. But uh, actually, this is something that Russia itself has been talking about. Uh, It was a truck bomb and spread very, very quickly around Russian circles, which was rather suspicious. So uh, it would appear more likely, and this is what we've been uh, doing some research on and it's not guaranteed yet but it's more likely to have been some kind of act of sabotage a massive explosion perhaps underneath the bridge caused by some kind of clandestine maritime drone but no doubt Don will be able to talk about that more in due course but I just wanted to flag that in other news uh, Belarusian forces are joining Russian troops on its border this is uh, quite a considerable Uh, development uh, overnight um, as, of course, Belarus served as a launch pad for the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February. And the defence ministry now in Belarus is saying that all the activities currently being carried out are aimed at responding adequately to actions near our borders. The president has ordered troops to deploy with Russian forces near Ukraine in a response to what he says is a clear threat to Belarus from Kyiv and its backers in the West. Although, obviously, the concern is amongst Western commentators is this is an attempt to uh, bolster forces in Belarus, perhaps for some kind of renewed attack on Kyiv. But as I say, no guarantee that that is the case, but that is what some are fearing. And just lastly, uh, an interesting intervention by somebody who doesn't usually make interventions, which is the uh, UK spy chief, the head of GCHQ, which is um, our our sort of uh, equivalent on working on 
um, on cyber threats and technological threats mostly. Um, and he has said that the Russian people are losing faith in Vladimir Putin's war of choice. He said it's becoming clear just quite how badly Putin has misjudged the situation. And uh, he's going to say further remarks later today with these other sort of the, the lines that have been put out prior to him giving this speech um, later on, where he will talk about how the Russian forces are now in a desperate situation as they seek to prosecute this disastrous war in Ukraine. Uh, Sir Jeremy Fleming will say, far from the inevitable Russian military victory that their propaganda machine spouted, it's clear that Ukraine's courageous action on the battlefield and in cyberspace is turning the tide. Having failed in two major military strategies already, already, Putin's plan has hit the courageous reality of Ukrainian defence. With little effective internal challenge, his decision-making has proved flawed. It's a high-stakes strategy that is leading to strategic errors in judgment. Now, of course, this has been one of the fundamental questions that we've dealt with on the podcast in recent uh, episodes, which is about this question of the extent of uh, questioning or anger or volatility within the Russian elite as a reaction to the war in Ukraine. And this is one of the first official sources we've heard from that is saying that they believe that there is a tide shifting. As I say, that's something that we talked about at length last week and perhaps with a slightly more sceptical frame of mind. But nonetheless, I think this is a significant intervention that we're right to flag. And just one final thing in relation to that. He's also in his speech highlighting the dangers posed by the Chinese leadership, warning that Beijing is using its financial and scientific muscle to manipulate strategically important technologies aiming to shape the global tech ecosystem. And I just flag that because I think it's significant to see not only the war in Ukraine in its context on the European continent, but the global ramifications of what this is doing to um, other autocratic powers around the world and how they're reacting to this. So um, lots going on, as I say, and sorry for for, for talking quite so long, um, but just to, uh, to, to quote Dom, I'll take a pause there. Thanks for that, Francis. Very interesting, as you say, that we've heard from the GCHQ president. Uh, Do we know what led Sir Jeremy to make the statement and what evidence he has to, to have drawn that conclusion? Well, of course, he won't reveal his sources, um, given that the, uh, the, the the secretive nature of the work that they do. But in terms of the intervention itself, we usually get some kind of speech like this once a year, um, providing an update for the press, for the, the international community and the, and the public at home as to what the heads of the intelligence services in Britain, which are highly regarded as, as one of, if not the best in the world, about what they see as the, as the major threat. Now, obviously, as a consequence of the war in Ukraine, there's been far more intervention from these uh, these heads of MI5, MI6 than is normal. But I think that this should be seen more in the context of of a of a of a regular speech that that's given, rather than being an urgent intervention as a reaction to the events of the past forty eight hours. Thank you for that, Francis. So next, I'd like to come to our guest, freelance journalist Sergio Olmos, who's speaking to us from Kiev, Ukraine. So you were in Kiev, obviously, when the missiles struck the city for the first time since June. Can you talk us through what happened that day through your eyes? Yesterday uh, in the morning, about 8.17 or something, uh, I heard a uh, really loud, what sounded like a jet. And, you know, here in Ukraine, obviously, if you don't hear anything that flies. Um, when you go towards the front, if you hear anything that flies, like I hate hearing drones um, because that means like someone's going to die, right? So anything that flies here is is, is dangerous. It's, it's a harbinger of death. So when I heard it, I was like, huh, I wonder if like the air, you know, the Ukrainian Air Force is doing some kind of show force or something. Or And and then the second later, an explosion uh, followed by a second one. And I, I counted the distance. I'm actually 650 meters from that first strike um, where the intersection and the uh, park was, Shevchenko Park. So um, kind of real quickly, just grabbed some clothes, grabbed my gear, you know, went out to to go document it, and there, you know there was more strikes, and um, you know, as a reporter, you're kind of used to running towards uh, explosions, but um, here in Kiev, you know, we haven't seen this in quite some some time. So um, I, I just returned from Liman, and I was in, you know, I, I've been covering uh, some of the, you know, recent liberated, liberated villages in 
Harkiv, like, you know, Azum and Kupiance. And Kupiance was heavy fighting when I went. But here in Kiev, you know, again, they haven't they haven't seen explosions in quite some time. So unlike some of those frontline places, unlike a city like Kharkiv that sees it almost every night, um, here it's quite unusual. And so when I showed up to the, the strike area, there was burned out cars and people panicking and police officers were really, you know, on edge and trying to set up a corridor and just yelling at me about, like, no phones and don't take pictures. And, you know, like it, 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 it I had to remind myself, like, oh, this is like a, you know, Kiev is kind of returned to a kind of state of almost like a, you know, Tel Aviv or Prague or something where it's it's it feels a, like a it feels like there's a there's, you know, a semblance of normalcy. And I had to remind myself, like, I'm not on the front line. I have to be very, you know, I, I have to kind of respect that these these emergency workers haven't done this maybe in a while. And they're going to be nervous about cameras and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and that was my initial kind of feeling. I mean, that, that was within that was within 20 minutes. I mean, when I, when I, I should add, I, I live next to school and I, the saddest thing, the thing that actually, I started crying when I was walking my car, which doesn't happen in the field is, uh, I, I, cause I saw kids running a shelter, like with their little backpacks and beanies on and it just made me really sad to be honest. Can you tell us about the view of Kiev today and what the damage is like around the city? Today it's, in the morning, it was pretty empty. Most most stores are still closed. I mean, I've 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 been talking about this, but it feels like it did in March. In in many ways, you know, in March there were there were some restaurants open, and some of the ones who were you know, for example, the hipsters who I will never criticize ever again in my life are some of the bravest people. They they will continue to stay open. They will not have any drop off in their standards of how they make a latte or anything. And so some of like the restaurants, especially the more kind of hipster ones, like not the corporate ones, not the, but the, some of them are open. They're packed, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to service people who were trying to get a meal or something. Uh, but most stores are still kind of closed. Uh, the streets are pretty empty still. Yesterday they were completely empty. Uh, almost everything was closed yesterday. And what we heard in the morning today was if you have like, um, you know, like if, if, if you might get a, an alert on your iPhone for like uh, in the United States, we have Amber Alerts, right? Today we got one of those where your iPhone lights up and it's an alert from the emergency service system here that said that, uh, you know, be careful today at the height of, of the day today, we expect more strikes. So, you know, he, uh, heed the air rates, uh, sirens, go to shelters and they have to do that. And, I, and this went all over Ukraine. But they have to do that because, especially here in Kiev, like I said, there hasn't been strikes in quite some time. People aren't don't adhere to the air raid sirens, um, like at all. And yesterday is when I went to the subways, and there were you know there were full of people. There was people that had brought their sleeping bags. Uh, people had brought like game boards. In, in one instance, they had like a, a set of uh, Uno. You know, like the youth were playing Uno. People had their backpacks. I asked some people, "How long do you think you'll stay here?" They, you know, they're like, I don't know. I might sleep here depending on how it goes tonight. Um, and so, like, in, in, on, on one hand, it was a real shock, I think, for Kiev. On the other, I think old habits kicked in. I, I know I saw one uh, apartment building uh, after another that just they had the doors open, even expensive ones where, you know, usually here in Kiev, the more expensive buildings, you have to, it's like multiple locks to get into the apartment building. Um, they were just having them open just so if people needed to run in from the street to go down to the shelter. So a lot of those old habits were kicking in for people. And I, and I do think that everybody I met yesterday, I don't think anyone I met on the street, like would have hesitated to share their meal or like donate blood. Like, you know, there was, there was that sense of like, of like fear, but also like, what is, what do you, do you need anything? You know, just kind of like, there is no suspicion amongst anyone. There is like, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a community that instantly forms that, you know, had been formed here in, in the early days. And, and I think that kicked in. And um, and one more note before I take a pause, uh, like Dom says, I, I continue to be astounded by in the height of the air raid sirens when there was no one on the street above the tunnels, above the subways where the lines of, you know, the pack of smokers who were just in the cold smoking, who, you know, <laughs> were braving the cold and the air raid sirens to, to smoke cigarettes. And that I, I, I still find those moments, uh, even in the midst of all the danger and fear, kind of, you know, um, kind of humorous. Yeah, that's so interesting to hear, Sergio. Thank you for that. Um, So continuing on the same vein, Natalia, I understand that you've been reporting some of the victims of yesterday's strikes. Could you tell us about what you've discovered so far? Hi, Claire. Um, Yes, that's exactly right. 
Um, I think those who followed yesterday's missile attacks, they saw um, horrible pictures of devastation. We saw a uh, giant crater in a park in central Kiev. We saw charred cars in the streets. But there was a, um, there was a very little idea um, about who was actually um, injured, who was killed. Um, um, again, um, when Russia claims that it was... Um, only going to, to target, uh, to strike military targets or in, um, infrastructure. Um, that claim um, um, obviously is very hard, is very diff- it's very easy to debunk because the airstrikes uh, came in around between 8 and 10 local time, which is a very, which is peak hours, busy time when people were going to work and school. And one of the people we know who was killed by um, that missile strike on a boulevard in central Kiev, um, it turned out to be a very well-known uh, surgeon who performed multiple um, bone marrow transplants for kids. Uh, she w- was working at um, Ohmadid, one of Kiev's uh, best-known and best children's hospitals. Um, and there was quite an outpouring of grief from her friends, from her colleagues, who described her... Um, um, as a courageous person, as a source of inspiration, to quote one of them, as someone who was always very kind to her patient and, and her colleagues. Um, uh, she had a child, she had a five-year-old, um, and as her hospital said, um, Oksana Leontieva, that, that is her name, um, she was um, on her way to work um, when um, uh, that Russian missile landed on the Shevchenko Boulevard. Um, she had just dropped off her kid at daycare um, and um, she was hurrying to see her patients, um, as the hospital put it. Um, and this is when a rocket um, struck the Shevchenko Boulevard and um, her car um, was one of those that you can see in, in multiple photos and, and footage from the scene, which was on fire, which basically um, uh, burned to the ground. Do we know anything more about other victims of yesterday's attacks? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, well, so far, if, if, if as far as I can see, there are nine, 19 people. Um, there's not really much known about it. There was one um, rather high-ranking police official who was killed in another airstrike on, airstrike on Kiev. Um, and it's quite interesting how Russian propagandists react to um, uh, to reports of um, of that death. Uh, Margarita Simanyan, the chief um, of uh, Russia's uh, TV network RT, when she spoke about the victims, she made it sound um, as if they were collateral damage and that the over 80 Russian missiles um, that were fired um, did, as she put it, um, relatively little damage and uh, claims relatively few lives, as, as she thought. Um, and she made it sound like the police official who was killed was not an accidental vi- the victim. Um, again, we don't know where exactly he was killed. It's likely that he was also on his way to work, as, as many people who were caught in the, um, in the missile strikes. So uh, Dr. Um, Oksana Leontio is probably the only person who we know where she was at the time and... Uh, we know she was she was killed in that attack. There doesn't seem to be many um, other stories, at least at this point, but it, this is probably still early days. Thanks for that, Natalia. Um, as you say, many of these victims were killed on their way to work. Am I right in thinking that the the timing was specifically chosen in order to um, in order to to impact commuters and sort of make the biggest hit on civilians rather than any military strategy? Uh, exactly. This is a very easy assumption to make. And um, if we look back at the start of the invasion, if we look back at uh, February the 24th, which was the day when uh, Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine, when Russia uh, first launched airstrikes all over the country, um, this happened in the early hours. We're talking about 4 or 5 a.m. Um, those airstrikes were um, simultaneous across the country from Lviv to Kiev. Um and um, they were happening around 8, um, 8 to 10 a.m., which is a very busy time. And, and for Kiev, I think it's important to say, um, I'm not sure if we mentioned it already, uh, Kiev has been relatively safe for months. Kiev hasn't seen any major um, airstrikes since the spring, essentially. 
um, for, I mean, it is already out of range for uh, even for long range artillery because there are no Russian troops around it. There are no Russian troops in the Kiev region anymore, unlike in, in April. Um, so if Russia wanted to attack the capital, it would have to use um, long range missiles. It would have to use something like Caliber or S-300 missiles. So, um, you know, it, it really took, took an effort to, um, uh, to, 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 to target uh, Kiev this time. Great, thank you for that, Natalia. Um, I'd like to come to you next, Joe. Uh, so G7 leaders, including Ukraine's President Zelensky, are due to meet today in the wake of Putin's barrage of deadly attacks on civilians. What do we know about the meeting so far and what might we expect the outcome to be later today? Hi, folks. Um, so, as we know, the group of seven nations, uh, the UK, the US, uh, Japan and, and so on, so basically the seven most powerful economies on the planet um kind of excluding russia are meeting as a video call they are there to basically discuss the next steps forward in terms of the war in ukraine it's very broad brush the g7 has been great at kind of coordinating the western sanctions effort um in as such it's how all of the most powerful economies come together and look to put financial pressure on Russia for its war in Ukraine. What we have heard so far, um, it seems to be very inf informal. We're not kind of, it's not a, it's not in person. So it's going, it's going to be actually a chance for these leaders to actually speak their minds. So Liz Truss, uh, Downing Street, have trailed to us that her main message is that these strikes on Kiev and other Ukrainian cities yesterday only kind of reinforced the need for Western governments to stay the course and continue supporting Ukraine with humanitarian aid, uh, military aid and financial aid uh, for as long as it takes basically to get this over the line and basically help Ukraine secure a victory. Um, the Zelensky moment, I think, is going to be a powerful one. He's um, he, has, he has spoken to absolutely everyone. He's kind of diplomatic reach has kind of even stretched as far as scouts groups in the UK um, and addressing addressing them. So what we're going to hear from him is a call for extra air defence systems, uh, basically to prevent things like this happening, or uh, not prevent, but at least guard against them better um, in the future. And th th this is something where the West is quite troubled. The, the UK has sent air defence systems and the promise more. The US has done likewise. Germany has done likewise. France has been a bit uh, sort of sketchier on this, mainly because their military is quite caught up in the fact that they believe they have limited stock of the air defence battery systems that they use and they want to kind of keep them to ensure France's protection in the future. So but that, that's essentially what Zelensky is going to be asking these Western governments for. And he's going to put a very, a very powerful kind of speech, I can imagine, um, so as of now, it's 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 about to start in about half hour. So our podcast listeners will be able to chart back and have a have a listen when they listen later tonight. But so here we have this moment is it gives the West a direct kind of moment to focus on. I think in as such, like Butcher, like Irpin, when we kind of see these kind of war crimes or atrocities appearing it really does kind of focus Western minds. So Liz Truss is going to seek to harness that and try and play a leading role. That's what that's what she has positioned herself as. Uh, Joe Biden will, of course, be the man to probably look at as, as the US is always kind of a leader on this front. And then it will also be a moment for the kind of Western governments also to put a bit of pressure on the EU and to make sure that the EU is not wavering when it comes to sanctions. And then... There's other, another meeting I'd like to mention as well where we're on, kind of on the front of diplomacy is uh, NATO's defence ministers, the military alliance, 30 defence ministers will meet in Brussels tomorrow and on Thursday. So tomorrow is going to be more kind of generalist, but actually Thursday is what we really need to be looking out for is because that is the meeting of the Ramstein format, which is the, or the Ukraine contact group, and that's the US-led effort to basically ensure Western weapons are delivered to Ukraine on time and in a quali quantity and quality enough to kind of affect the change on the battlefield. Um, so 
while these details are kept very scarce because no one likes to kind of divulge what weapons or until they've actually arrived on the ground in Ukraine, what we can expect is hopefully uh, on Ukraine's behalf is some extra promises. And will Zelensky see kind of these promises of extra air defence systems? So I heard from the Ministry of Defence yesterday that Britain is kind of prepared to ramp up what it has sent. It has sent so far these kind of stormer armoured vehicles, which have Star Streak missiles attached to them that are basically rocket launched air defence systems. And then we've sent more. Sorry, pardon me. I've had a bit of a cough all week and I was just trying to start it off there. Um, we've sent kind of shoulder mounted air defence systems. And, and so now Britain is, start, um, as kind of Liz Trust probably promised to. Vladimir Zelensky yesterday is Britain will kind of supply more of these to protect Ukrainian cities and Ukrainian soldiers against aerial bombardment in the form of whether it be Shahid drones, the Iranian uh, kamikaze or suicide drones that we come back to later, no doubt, or um, the dwindling suppliers of kind of Russian precision long range weapons such as the Kleber cruise missile or other kind of objects launched from various. Uh, whether they be planes or rocket launchers that are Russia has in its arsenal. And I, I will take a pause there. If I could just jump in, Joe, I, I think it's also what you were talking there about these defence systems. It's worth noting that I was doing some reading into this yesterday, that some of these defence systems the Ukrainians were asking for many months ago, more or less immediately after the invasion. But there was huge hesitancy amongst Western powers to give those weapons because they cited the fact they didn't have enough of them. But they also cited a crucial factor, which was about the amount of time they said it would train the Ukrainians to to use them. And the fact is, is that if these weapons had been given earlier, then the Ukrainians would be using them now. Um, and the fact that they haven't, I think, speaks volumes to the nature of how many Western powers didn't think that Ukraine would be able to resist um, for as long as they did and certainly didn't think that it would be possible to launch the counteroffensive that they uh, have since then. And I think it's also evidence as well of just quite how fast and far things have have moved in terms of the kind of weapons that the the, the West has has provided for Ukraine. It's just worth bearing in mind and thinking back to to late February and early March time, just the degrees of of questioning and scepticism about whether providing any weapons at all or too many weapons amongst many Western powers would would escalate matters in Ukraine. And I think that it's very easy for us because things have developed so incrementally to miss sight of the bigger picture, which is just the extent to which the West is now giving such high-tech weaponry to Ukraine, perhaps most notoriously the HIMARS, but indeed these defence systems would be another example of that. We are It's chalk and cheese from where we were back um, in, in, in February, March time. But nonetheless, and this is something I know we've touched on in this podcast before, I think something to be sensitive to here is that this is still very much, for all of the, the talk about the G7 meeting and, and, and the NATO one that you speak about, there is, I think, still still a sense that, that, that the West is reactive rather than proactive in Ukraine. Now, on the one hand, that's that's easy to, 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 to see why, because Putin is willing to do things that Western powers are not willing to do. He's willing to commit um, these heinous acts. And there's really very little that the West can do, I think, to um, that, that would be as proactive to, to prevent some of these these events from occurring just because Putin is able to do them. But I do still think that there, is, there are things that can be done, or at least there are questions to be asked about what can be done, to make it at least appear on the strategic sense that the West is is being more proactive in predicting Putin's next move and and flagging what they expect Putin's next move to be and thereby potentially deterring the Russians from doing so or further than that, saying what would happen in certain situations, whether that be nuclear in nature, whether that be about red lines around the nuclear power plants, those kind of questions. So I suppose I'm opening up to the floor really as a, as a broad question. I'm interested to hear your reflections on that, Joe, as to whether you think there is anything that the West can do to appear more proactive rather than reactive to what Putin has been doing in Ukraine. Yeah, so first I'll, 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 I'll talk about the hesitance to send these kind of air defence systems around. And one thing that NATO is going to hopefully agree at some sort of level this week is the placement of extra air defence systems in NATO territory. So in whether it be on Poland, in Romania, kind of on that eastern front line closest to Russia. 
And there are genuine concerns um, as it comes with every weapon, whether it be kind of higher Mars or uh, kind of other artillery systems or, or, or tanks that kind of the West just doesn't have enough to spare. And everyone is concerned about their own national sovereignty and what happens and not wanting to be caught short if, if sort of something catastrophic happens, which is probably highly unlikely, but given the continent is at war, you never know. Well, there's war on the continent rather than the continent at war, sorry. Um, and then going back to training, yes, that was also an issue, is you, the um, West was seemingly keen to donate as much kind of Soviet-era technology. So they were leaning on the likes of the Poles, the Slovaks, the Bulgarians, uh, Czechs, etc., who have access or still have these um, these systems kind of in their stockpiles. And then they were doing something known as backfilling. So, for instance, Britain would send tanks to Estonia, in you know, like British Western tanks to Estonia, to backfill what Estonia was sending on to Ukraine. Um, and but I think actually the the thing that really highlights where the West probably got it wrong was Ukraine's ability to adapt. Um, their military now, and you speak to kind of people in NATO circles, is the most experienced army on the continent when it comes to combat. They've we've seen them uh, adapt very quickly. Their artillery men adapt absolutely with like in a matter of hours or days, like to being able to use Western kind of MRS, the multi-launch rocket systems, uh, the HIMARS, the British M270s, um, and they're now using them to devastating effect. So kind of the, the question of can Ukraine actually use Western weapons is is almost a bit contradicting to their soldiers who are now some of the most experienced combative uh, troops on, on, well, on the planet. Um, and then we went back to the idea of changing our aid to what we uh, how the, it develops on the battlefield. And so in his readout, uh, James cleverly mentioned of a, his readout from a call with his Ukrainian counterpart, Dmitry Kuleba, he said, we would continue to assess what practical support, and the practical support is in, in quotation marks. So constantly, one thing that Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, is doing, and other kind of British officials, they're constantly speaking to their counterparts in Ukraine and asking, what do you actually need to, to match the situation on the ground now? Um, and at one point they would have asked for multi-launch rocket systems as they were preparing for counter-offensives uh, over the summer months. Um, now they're going to obviously switch to this. The priority will be air defence systems because the, the war by nature, we're coming up to the, the muddy season. I know Roland speaks about a lot how it will likely become kind of the com or the combat kind of zones will come dug in. They'll become slow moving because you just can't physically do it in, in, the, in the winter weather until everything freezes over again. So long range systems are going to be key um russia is said to be kind of loop wading through its supplies of long-range precision weapons if you listen to jeremy jeremy fleming of gchq or other western officials who have been briefing on this for well since april um so and with putin kind of the front lines changing dramatically over weeks he will have to reach for a new kind of arsenal or a different tactic and that will likely be long-range weapons that is why ukraine has Basically changed its demands and gone put more priority on on these long on these long range air defence systems, basically to protect uh, its civilians. But also, I think one thing that we know and we can feel and see is how does Ukraine deploy these air defence systems? Does it a use them to protect civilian populations, which is kind of what it's doing at the moment? But that then leaves its troops on the front line slightly vulnerable. So it probably wants to have a bigger spread so it can then equally protect its soldiers on the front line in making advances. Because if you control the, the skies over, over where you're trying to advance, uh, Dom would probably tell you that that gives you a military advantage. So this is this is why um, Ukraine is going so heavily after air defence systems, A, to protect its population, but also then to protect its, its, civil, uh, its uh, front line troops a bit more and give them a better fighting chance to take back land uh, before it becomes impossible to, to do so. And I'll stop there. Thanks for that, Joe. Sergio, if I could come back to you, um, what does the average Ukrainian think of the level of support provided by the West? So the Ukrainians I talk to uh, always are kind of open the roundup by saying, like, of course, we're very grateful and happy and 
you know, I, I'm American especially, so they sometimes they work high margins into the conversation. But um, they always open up with that and then kind of, you know, then kind of reveal their, you know, their true opinion, which is anxiety and, and fear and a kind of sense of urgency. of. And th- again, these are just everyday Ukrainians. I'm not talking about, you know, military officers I speak to or, you know, uh, uh, mayors. This is just like grandmas and, you know, young professionals and stuff like that, you know, um, who, who know the word high Mars, by the way. I mean, it is grandmas out here know the word high Mars. Uh, but when you start talking to them, uh, they will tell you like, we need more. Uh, we need more. You know, we need more anti-air defense. Um, some of the some of the opinions are, are revolve around like offensive weapons. But honestly, most of the time, you're hearing like, we just, you know, we don't want to die in the street, right? It's it's undignified to just be walking to a grocery store and have to run for cover. And, and it is. It, it, it honestly is. Um, and so, just talking to re- regular Ukrainians, uh, there is a sense of urgency. But, but again um what makes it quite sad is that they ha- they they are very aware of how they're asking for this they, you know their 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 language always includes like we are re- very grateful for the level of support so far that kind of thing even when you're not you know even when you're not like on record right when you're just having drinks with ukrainians just having a night out you know they're very aware that the west has been helpful and i think that is always um part of the way they they talk about it at, at least to westerners um, but like, make no mistake, uh, they they want more. They want to live a, a peaceful life, and they know that if they had air defenses like the way Western countries have, um, they would have that. And I'm wondering if there, if you've heard any criticism of the West from Ukrainians, and if you have heard that on the ground, what are what are they saying? Yeah, the, of course, there's criticisms. Um, on balance, though, there's usually just more of you know. There's more of, of, there's more of like what, what. So for example, there's more criticisms of specific countries than the West in general. Uh, you'll hear, especially a few months ago, Germany. You know that was the the prime target. People would kind of criticize Germany or criticize France. There are a lot of uh, criticism of specific leaders. You know, like kind of uh, Emmanuel Macron's. You know, uh, trying to. Uh, uh, negotiate with Putin and, and the humiliation that followed all that. Uh, there was a lot of criticism a- around specific things like that. Um, I think in general, they, the, what, what you, I think what you're asking is, are, are there, is there stuff that you're not seeing? Like, you know, that, that it is in private or are Ukrainians actually more resentful or something like that? Not as much as you'd think. I mean, I, I think it, it's mostly like, I wish I would do more. I wish I would have done this earlier. I wish they would have believed us. There's a lot of that. I think, um, and again, I'm not talking about officers and uh, and politicians, just regular people. There's a lot of like, you know, I, I wish people would believe us when they, we say like, hey, this is like a, an existential threat for us. You know, the, the, the Russians really do want to uh, dominate us in a way that like, you know, no one could survive. You know, we cannot have a butcher all over the country. And, and I think that every time there is something like what happened yesterday in Kiev, where there's Again, a busy intersection, which I'm, I'm I'm right now 650 meters from that intersection where the missile struck, uh, where, you know, just people are just walking and trying to, you know, uh, do their laundry or whatever, get a coffee and they and they have to run for cover or they, they get struck by a missile. But this is undignified. This is unbecoming of, of just a regular human existence. And they um, they wish the West would have kind of believed them earlier, would deliver this stuff earlier um, if to them. They just feel like they're doing the hard part, which is, you know. They're fighting on the battlefield. All they're asking for is the weapons that are already, in, you know, in warehouses sitting somewhere and money so that, you know, so Westerners don't have to fight the Russians. Like, they'll do the job. They're not even, at this point, they're not even asking for boots on the ground, right? They're just asking, like, give us the weapons we know you have so that, you know, these guys don't dominate us and then try to, you know, dominate someone else afterwards. Hi, Sergio. Um, just have a question from me, which may seem a very Anglo-centric question, but I'm genuinely interested because I'm. Oh, there's been so much talk about the significance of Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, former British Prime Minister, should I say, in the context of the war in Ukraine and how he was revered in the country and was, was arguably the second most famous man in the country at one point. Um, I'm just wondering what, whether there's been any similar reaction or recognition of, of the new British Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who have of course, was the foreign secretary under Boris Johnson and has been equally, if not more, robust in her criticisms of Putin. Yeah, I, I think m- many people know Liz Truss, but it's not the same level of celebrity as uh, Boris Johnson. And jo- again, I'm American and I can tell you that Biden, President Biden has not talked about 
at all, like in the same ballpark as the way that Boris Johnson has talked about revered. I mean, they make songs about Boris Johnson. If, if you do a, any kind of road trip here with Ukrainians, one of the, uh, in their playlist of music is going to be a remix where Boris Johnson is in there somehow. Uh, you'll see paintings of uh, murals of Boris Johnson. You'll see uh, like, like coffee shops or, or restaurants that have like an, a, a restaurant item with Boris Johnson in it somehow. Right. Um, we, we're not seeing that with Liz Trust. To be fair, she, you know, this is she just came in. She just came into power, so you know it might take some time. But my, my I can tell you that uh, n- I don't think many people here know who the vice president of the United States is, right? Like uh, Biden is 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 people know who that is, but again, there's no sandwich named after him. Boris Johnson's level of of admiration, celebrity, here and respect uh, is is huge. I mean, I I, I can't understate it. I, I, I'm surprised, but. That by how how revered he is, but I can tell you it, it is absolutely the case. That's really interesting, and I thought you might say that. And I think probably one of the main reasons for that, aside from the fact that it was Boris Johnson who was was so proactive early on in the war, is also this this fact that he was a brilliant and still is a brilliant articulator of of why the war is significant. He's a has a character. He's theatrical. He's a communicator, and and. What you realise is, in that sort of Churchillian sense, the importance of that, of, of, of being something more, of larger than life, uh, really matters to inspire people um, and, and to draw people's attention. And of course, it's something as well, although, albeit in a different mould, that Vladimir Zelensky has, a former comedian, of course, somebody who understands television, who understands the importance of charisma. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's fascinating that we've lived in an age, really, I think, or certainly I did when I was growing up, where people always talked about politics in terms of systems, um, that the role of the individual individual leader was diminished greatly um, as opposed to the sort of great forces of history, whether it be democracy or liberalism, autocracy, whatever. But actually, I think what Ukraine has done is drawn attention again to the importance of the individual leader at critical, critical moments. And as I've said before on this podcast, I think that Vladimir Zelensky has been absolutely integral to Ukraine's success, not only in the way in which he has um, conducted the war, but in the symbolic way in which he has united the West. A different leader may have reacted very very differently and we would be facing a very very different situation in in the war in Ukraine as a consequence of that. Thanks Francis. Coming back to you Joe, is the provision of these extra weapons called upon by President Zelensky likely to end or at least counter the current amplified missile strikes we're seeing from Russia? In the short term no is the is the answer to that and unfortunately that's the nature of military logistics um is these systems are often very big and actually take quite a bit of time to get over to um, to Ukraine. So the one example of that is yesterday the Germans said that they would have one of their, so one of four, or maybe it was two of four, sorry, um, off the top of my head, of their Iris T anti kind of air defence systems uh, would, would arrive in Ukraine within days. They were promised um, in kind of mid-September by Olaf Scholz the Americans also have kind of um, promised NASAMs and there was a kind of bit of a mistranslation uh, saying that these kind of American uh, NATO standard air defense systems had already landed in Ukraine. But actually, the Americans said no. And Vladimir Zelensky, who initially announced it, well, through a kind of a bumble translation with an American broadcaster, uh, originally announced it. And they said no. And they, they, but they said they would take uh, they would arrive within two months. So actually... When these systems get there, and I'm sure the Ukrainians will deploy them to great effect in protecting their citizens or troops on the front line, but actually it's just the time and effort it takes to get these systems to Ukraine is the real problem. Um, so if it's going to take two months for the Americans to get something over, uh, a month or so for Germany to kind of get its acting, uh, its uh, kind of acting to gear, then we're going to see more and more Russian missile land because. Basically, one of the, the things is you look is a single missile is uh, kind of easy to take out. It's a, it's a, but when they are firing kind of munitions in the quantity that we saw yesterday, um, it was about 83 missiles were fired and 24 kind of suicide loitering drones were fired. Some of them are bound to get through that Ukraine scarce air defences. So until Ukraine has enough of these systems, it's not going to create a full kind of protective dome around its populations and its frontline troops. So that's that's the real challenge is, is, the, is the logistics and the time it takes for these systems to arrive. 
Thank you for that, Joe. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, so I'd like to come to everybody for their final thoughts. If I can come to you first, Natalia, what are your final thoughts you'd like to leave our listeners with, please? Sure. Um, I don't think we mentioned today that yesterday's attack um, came just a couple of days after uh, Vladimir Putin appointed a new general to lead the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, this is someone who is quite notorious in, Russians, uh, in Russia's armed forces. His name is Sergei Sorovkin. Uh, Sorovikin, I'm sorry. Uh, he um, famously, or rather infamously, um, led Russia's operation um, in Syria. He was the one who was responding, uh, responsible for bombings in Aleppo. So for many uh, Russian army watchers, what happened in Ukraine was not surprising. And the expectation was that with him um, at the helm of the um, Russian military operation in Ukraine, um, we are likely to have, uh, we're likely to see even more indiscriminate shelling, even more acts of, even more war crimes and military actions, which essentially would have little or no regard to um, human life um, in terms of um, you know pursuing military goals, whatever military goals Kremlin would have at this point. Thank you for that, Natalia. If I can come to you next, Sergio, from the ground in Ukraine, what are your final thoughts for our listeners, please? Yeah, so what's interesting to me is that there, for, for many months, there was a sense of despair in Ukrainians and, and what what started to lift that was the strikes in Crimea. Uh, there was a lot of like joy and pride. I mean, uh, people were showing each other the videos of the strikes in Crimea, and, and then the, the counteroffensives began. Kharkiv, and and now we're seeing Kherson. But I, I think people forget how um, how much despair and how much like uh, just not a great outlook was was occurring. You know, there, we were heading into the winter. But what, be, beginning with the strikes in Crimea and the counteroffensive, Ukraine started feeling optimism and a sense of like, I mean, they've had hope this whole time, but really like a sense of like riding high and, and feeling like, ah, OK, I, I think we can do this. Um, the strikes yesterday, I think, re- like changed all that again. It, it remind, it, I think it's a reminder of how brutal and, um, you know, uh, inhuman th- this is, right? Like hitting people while they're walking to work is just wrong. I mean, and and I think reporters were on the front lines quite often. So for us, you know, every week we're seeing a village that's been destroyed uh, for Kiev to, you know, for to them to have to deal with these missiles. And it's a reminder that like for most of this war, Ukraine has been a heavy underdog. It's been facing incredible odds. And in the last couple weeks, there's just been a sense of like, OK, I, you know, maybe they're on parity with with Russia. Maybe they, they, they got this. And I think it's a reminder of the world that, you know, this is. This is still a steep uphill battle. These Ukrainians are digging deep to like, you know, to make everything work to the economies, you know, not doing well. They're, they're, I mean, they are they're they, The attitude here, the resiliency here is is incredible. Um, and when something like what happens yesterday happens, you know, it, it, it puts a wound. It, it really dents, you know, the, anyone's a spirit. Um, and I think that uh, if if the West kind of does turn its back or kind of loses interest or whatever, um, that's going to have a serious effect, especially as we head, in, head into the winter. Um, but uh, I, I think, um, I think the battlefield really hasn't changed. Right, yesterday's attacks were against civilians, uh, mostly in infrastructure. Ukraine is still doing incredibly well on the battlefield. I, I'm heading out to Kherson soon to see some of the liberated villages, and um, the reality is that Ukraine is still winning the war on the battlefield, which is why the, the, you know. Russia is stepping its, up, up, up its attacks against civilians because it's not doing well on the battlefield. Thank you, Sergio. I'm sure we, we'd like to hear more about what you discover um, at a later date. Um, so over to you, Joe Barnes. Do you have any closing thoughts for our listeners? Uh, yes, I do. And it was one that kind of struck me. Um, and it actually does kind of set in kind of stone what kind of Western officials and intelligence kind of sources have been telling us that actually the Russian war machine isn't quite up to scratch or is just purely kind of evil is the the fact that in Shevchenko Park there was a massive crater from one impact uh, missile uh, in the Ukrainian capital um, that was next to a children's play park. A university was kind of crashed into and blown up and 
when Vladimir Putin announced that his attacks were a success, he said they were all military targets. So it's um, it kind of thing, things like this when they happen, it kind of reinforces that either Russia is struggling and actually coming into just basically desperation and just giving something to its people back at home to show that Vladimir Putin and his war machine haven't lost kind of complete control of the situation or it highlights in the West just the pure desperation of what needs to be done and and hopefully wins over a few a few kind of critics uh, especially when it comes into the winter months uh, to make sure Ukraine gets the support it needs uh, to protect its citizens and kind of reclaim uh, lands that have been taken by force so that's that's basically you kind of you hope that it really does kind of help focus minds on on kind of this in the west going forward especially in kind of the next few days of diplomacy with it in the g7 nato and then um looking forward there could be a nato leaders meeting next week because there's talk of that be done virtually so it's hopefully it's kind of it's a it's a really sad thing but hopefully these kind of sad events do kind of focus the minds and, and kind of thoughts in the west to make sure that ukraine still keeps getting what it needs to, to win the war. Mm. And finally to you, Francis, I believe you have something for our listeners to ponder. Thanks, Claire. Yes, some will find, I think, what I'm about to say as my final thought controversial, and I'm expecting a bit of backlash, but I think it has to be said. I'm noticing a, a worrying trend since this war began, but particularly in recent months, the, of depicting people... Uh, the Russian population specifically, as barbarians or as often dubbed on Twitter, orcs. Some vocal people are claiming that democracy can never germinate in Russia, that the soil isn't fertile for liberalism and that therefore we have to punish the Russian people as the, quote, subhumans that they are. Now, of course, it's true to say that there is complicity in the crimes that are taking place in Ukraine amongst the Russian population, just as there was for the Germans in the Third Reich. But I think to stain all Russians with Putin's blood is a step too far and one that ultimately actually plays into Putin's narrative that the Russian people have a, have a different soul to, to Westerners. Ultimately, history shows that most people want the same things and to peddle a narrative that suggests that this is true uh, except of everywhere except Russia is, is just unjust for, on the one hand but is also counterproductive if you look at Russian history Russian elites have flirted with liberal ideas in the past the December uprising in 1825 the February revolution of course in 1917 before the Bol- Bolsheviks overthrew them and yet those flirtations with liberalism have been stunted by violence and suppression of a minority, including, of course, by Putin in the 1990s. So I think the West must continue to put pressure on Russia so that people can recognise the consequences of the war and giving an opportunity for other voices to cut through. And so with that in mind, I just wanted to draw attention to a, a smaller story today, one easy to lose, but important not to forget in the backdrop of these Russian atrocities, which is that a Russian opposition politician called Vladimir Karamuza, who is educated in the West, is in a courtroom, uh, was shown in a courtroom cage yesterday. He was arrested back in April, um, accused of treason on the basis of three speeches that he gave, uh, talking about the rigged elections in Russia and the need for a free press to give Russians the truth about war crimes in Ukraine. For these, he was called a threat to Russia's constitutional order and sovereignty, and as a consequence, as I say, is now on trial. I spoke last week about the Nobel Prize and how it was given to those who worked at the Russian charity Memorial, which was seeking to record Stalin's crimes. And I think as long as there are people who are willing to do that dangerous work, we have to believe that there is hope for Russia in the long term. Because if we don't, the West is truly doomed in the century ahead because we're conceding the idea that there is a universalism in Western values, that most people, when given the choice, want freedom of choice and freedom of speech. So it's vital that we don't give in to Putin's narrative, that we stand up for these values everywhere. Otherwise, we are dooming ourselves, I think, to defeat. We're doing the Russian people an injustice and we're playing into the real barbarians' hands, like Vladimir Putin. 
Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. Ukraine The Latest was produced today by Louisa Wells and on Twitter, Jaden Irving.